Jason, instead of talking about a director tonight on the show, why don't we dive into a found footage film called Murder, Death, Koreatown? I think in lieu of talking about the director, uh, we should talk about the movie itself because we do not know who directed this movie. (laughs) Um, Now, a lot of that information was kept secret, it seems, um, because there was a viral campaign to launch uh, this movie earlier this year. They uh, they really went hard into the whole found footage thing. They did a whole imager page and like a Reddit campaign where like, oh, this is K Anon. They found this footage and kind of pieced it together to try to figure out what happened. This was a real murder that happened. Um, you know, uh, a wife murdered her husband in Koreatown, and somebody who was a neighbor got real freaked out because he didn't feel safe. And then watch his descent into madness, and you know, see the footage we found. So we don't really know anything about uh, who actually shot the movie. Everything about this movie is like shrouded in mystery like you said there's no credits attached to it except the you know an ambiguous uh anon who's the who's the editor that apparently has you know in the lore of the film has found this and you know decided to kind of chop it up and make it more cinematic and add you know non-diegetic sound effects and music to it uh even the production company uh the audience house who you know thank you for the opportunity to re- to review this film is a whole puzzle and that adds to the mystique of murder death koreatown tonight i have broken my cardinal rule jason and i feel very disappointed in myself i swore off elysian after they got bought out by inbev but alas, I am drinking a uh, 8.1% Imperial uh, Oatmeal Stout, the Dragon's Tooth. Um, yeah, it just looked very like something I'd pick up from Koreatown, and I just really felt like I wanted an Oatmeal Stout. So that's what I chose. Look, man, InBev is going to InBev, and um, sometimes they ruin your product, and sometimes they just distribute your product. So, you know, maybe uh, we don't throw them out of the bus entirely, especially if they're making dragon's tooth which is delicious yeah i do not have any affordable beer in the house (laughs) now that's not to say i don't have any beer i'm just like going into the cellar and uh, i busted one of my four bottles of a very limited release the dark horse from marshall michigan did a quadruple ipa called quantum leap Mm. it's a collaboration with revelry from charleston south carolina it is quadtastic um (laughs) i've had one of the four before um just uh, busting into this now, it's got a really nice color to it, and um, this it tastes a little mo- more mature than the last bottle I had about a year ago. So, excellent, Lachaim. Prost. Ironic that you know a show like ours that we our, our main show we dive into filmmakers and and what makes them tick and whatnot. And this we the first one of these series, uh, you can't find a lick of of information on it, but I think that's cool. It, it feels like. I'm transported back to, you know, the late 90s when the, the Blair Witch Project came out. Is this uh-huh. as good as the Blair Witch? We'll get into that. Um, although the the score is, is quite high for this film. Uh, a film that you could go and go on Amazon and rent for, I believe, around two ninety nine ish Why don't you jump into it? What is the, I guess, non-spoiler, what, what's Murder, Death, Koreatown about? Um, well, we went into it a little bit with um, with reading some of the Canon stuff. Uh, the imager page they did is actually really interesting. It's got about 70 photos that you could tell like were taken when they shot the movie. Um, there's some cool stuff like a fake uh, news report and, and stuff like that. You know, they, they did a, a lot on the marketing, which, you know, you could do for free, I guess, if you're going to do a viral marketing thing. So, um I just I like the fact that this was just shot on an iPhone and, you know, guerrilla marketed and, uh, you know, all, all this kind of stuff. But um, the, the, the thrust of the film was uh, this was found footage. Some guy lived next door to a um, a couple in Koreatown where the uh, 
the wife went nuts and just stabbed her husband to death. And then the police arrested her covered in blood very far from the apartment. And the, the neighbors freaked out. And instead of just letting it go, he starts poking around a little bit and asking a few questions. And the more questions he asks, the weirder the stuff he uncovers is. And, you know, people don't want to talk to him. He sees weird graffiti all around the city. And so the more he uncovers, the the deeper he's enmeshed in this sort of weird conspiracy with this uh, group called the Pastors and, uh, you know, a mysterious homeless person who knows a lot more than he says. And, um, you know, it's a uh, it's got a sort of a predictable climax for the genre. But sure. like, it, that's not a spoiler, per se. It's just sort of this movie goes where it's going to go. And you don't watch this movie to be surprised at the end. You watch this movie to be creeped out, out the whole way. And I think this does that well. It takes that trope of the kind of meddling neighbor, that uh, Disturbia type deal, that character, and really kind of ramps that up. Uh, you know, you're in this kind of very normal block in uh, an actual, you know, block in California. And so the realness of this is what sells this. Um, and then, it, you know, I, I think that it, what it did well, just as far as like the execution goes, is it plays up, you know, is you're questioning everything maybe not as much questions as our you know POV or literal POV during the entire time um, but you're questioning throughout the ride if what is happening you're you're invested in in finding in uncovering the truth and then as it goes on you kind of question if he's even a reliable narrator you know because mm -hmm. everyone around him uh, is is basically telling him to f off the whole time or you know that he's just kind of given up and uh, or that he should give up the you know that's that's kind of where it succeeds and being yeah. I mean this is literally someone walking out of their house and filming an entire feature 80 minute runtime uh, but still you know feature nonetheless for zero money like this this guy basically you know whatever he paid the, the cast or whatever who knows but I mean this is anyone can make this type of movie with friends um, and the fact that I think, like you said earlier, he got this thing on Amazon, and and us talking about it. That's that's cool, you know. That, that, those are the the things that this movie really succeeded on. Yep, um, it definitely does a good job of creeping you out, and it definitely does a good job of just making the most of nothing. I mean, Steven Soderbergh is shooting movies on iPhones right now, sure. like. So this is a way to like I, I don't want to have to sell a script. And get Hollywood involved like this is my film school. Mm -hmm. um, w one place I didn't think that the uh, the film succeeded was uh, the POV character who I suspect is the writer slash director. Um, isn't really cut out for acting. Right. And talked a lot and did a little bit of improvisation or just dialogue that seemed half remembered. And I thought he was the worst thing about this movie. Yeah. Unfortunately, I think he's probably going to be a fine writer and director um, and picking the store sort of, oh, I'll make the Blair Witch. It, the reason found footage horror movies are made is because you can do them cheaply. Mm -hmm. And um, if this is his film school, nice film school. Um, sure. I don't think this guy's cut out to be an actor. And it's unfortunate that like to get his main actor to work for free, he needed it to be him. Right. Um, but everybody else he got was pretty good. So uh, if he didn't spend a lot of money on this movie, he found some really talented people, to, you know, kind of uh, chip in. Um, I don't know if any of these people have acted before because there's like no IMDb information about anybody in the movie. Yeah. But a few characters, particularly the uh, the homeless character that kind of guides him through the movie, um, were quite good. Quite good. I, I, I'm still not convinced that he's just not uh, an actual person that lives in an alley and, and the, this guy kicked him, you know, 50 bucks to read some lines. I mean, th it's very believable. There's you could tell the actors or at least like the, the actor friends, you know, of his uh, that are that are like reading lines. I think like the first um, landlord guy he comes in contact with, he's hamming it up. You know, it's like, yeah, cool. You know, whatever. <laughs> Um, but some of them, yeah, especially like the, the other landlord that you're introduced to later sells it organic performances. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but yeah, like you said, real bummer that, you know, in most found footages like the Blair Witch or other ones, they tend to be more like slasher films or, 
what's going on to a group of people off camera. And that works because, and that works a little bit better than this did, in my opinion, because when you're, you are literally tethered to this person's hip the entire time. And if that person is unlikable, it's going to make the movie a little bit less enjoyable. And that's what, you know, I completely echo your sentiment. I just think, I mean, I was getting a real like Tina Bob's burgers vibe and that was throwing me out of it. And, and that's, uh... <laughs> it's not, <laughs> it's uh, no fault of his own. Like the, it's this dude's voice. But when that's what I'm like, going through the motions with, you know, to, you know, just going to like four different spaces, uh, and, you know, trying to, to get some real, like, uh, creepy scenes. I was, it was really starting to, to wear on me. So overall, I think if you view this as like, oh, this is another, um, paranormal activity. If you go into it with that attitude, you're going to be, um, a little bit disappointed, I think. Mm -hmm. But I think if you view this as like, look, this is somebody just, did it yeah i think it has merit if like well this is somebody's first deal and potentially this could be end, end up being somebody who like with a budget could do some good work so um i think some of the low budget aspect sort of isn't to the film's credit in terms of atmosphere because like it's a little bit grainy sometimes and um, a lot of shaky. Yep. And I don't think he did a lot of takes. Sure. And um, so I think that's that seems a little bit more organic. You know, it seemed like um, not directors would be like, oh, people never have any vocal slip ups or say um or ah or anything. They just like everyone talks perfectly all the time, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, this seemed a little bit more believable just because people were stumbling over their words a little bit and sure. that, like that's how people talk to each other. So yeah. all in all, I, I think he managed to leverage the limitations and, and like make them sort of to the, the movie's credit. And I think that's what the found film horror movie genre does. And um, this is another example of something from that uh, from that genre. And if that's something you like this this is a good example of it. Yeah. Uh, one more thing uh, that I I don't want to harp on too much, but it just found it just felt a little too glossy as far as most found footage. You're, you're getting those long, longer, imperfect takes. This was edited up like a feature. Um, you know, that's I guess that's part of the story is this was found from mm -hmm. the narrator, and you know now this editor picked it up and added those those sound effects and added the music, but just the the way it's shot sometimes, you know, sometimes it's like he's, he's literally walking and, and he's like pointing the camera to the ground, which is more believable in, in this kind of a, a real documentary style, you know, filmmaking. Uh, but sometimes it's, it's just like everything's framed too perfectly. And it, it just feels like a movie sometimes a little bit too much for my liking. But again, for the most part, you know, if, if it's, you know, two ninety nine, one ninety nine. If you're a fan of this kind of genre, I mean, we there hasn't been a lot of these films in a while, right? Like, so if, yeah. if, if you kind of like miss this or feel nostalgic for this kind of uh, horror, then go for it. You know, the mystery is not too mysterious, but uh, the rides, I, I've seen wor a lot worse movies for uh, with a lot huger budgets. So it's it's nice and creepy. So, yeah. Would you suggest people watching this? Yeah, um, watch it in the dark. Nice, yeah. Absolutely. All right, well, uh, that is our review of Murder, Death, Koreatown. Thank you for the audience house for this one. Uh, my name's John. You can find me at on Twitter at Orzov Dunn. Uh, Jason, where can people find you? I'm at Jason E. Alt on the Twitter, and uh, I do other stuff other than movie reviews, so uh, check out my pin post, and you can see all the other projects I work on. And follow us at film underscore hooligans on Twitter as well. Uh, until next time, we'll see you.